Gren Rising and welcome to show four on Conversations on Art, a program designed for friends and acquaintances to get together to share their experiences um, in their art, in their process, in their practice and hopefully in some way we can help each other share our work and learn. Um, today I have with me uh, my co-host Annie, Gwen Rising Annie. Gwen Rising, Gwen Rising. Joining us today is a um, friend from New York, filmmaker, poet, newscaster, Ade, Gwen Rising Ade. Grand Rising Ron. And sorry, I forgot, uh, Annie, textile artist and painter. And today's guest, multimedia artist, Claire. Gwen Rising Claire. Grand Rising, Dan, and everyone. Nice to be here. Grand Rising. Okay, let's get right into it. Claire, can you please tell us about your art and what it is that you do? Yeah. Um, well, I think my practice is developing in creating what you could call immersive experiences in which sensorality is activated in different ways. So it's often a combination of video installation and sculptural elements that sort of quite literally reflect each other. So in the videos, often you have these sculptures, but from different angles and different perspectives. Um, but I'm also, um, I also interested in writing. So I last year I finished a book um, and uh, there are different aspects of my work, but lately it's more about, it's evolving into creating a sort of immersive experience. So how do I, as the viewer, the watcher, how would you like us to come to approach your work? Um, well, I guess that anyone has come to free and inevitably will approach my work uh, differently. I think it's impossible to all approach in a similar same way. But uh, I hope that my work can invite to sort of presence by a physical activation. Um, so I, I hope that the work can create a moment or an experience of present and physical exploration of a certain situation. But then I think that uh, the predisposition everyone goes in arrives in different ways in front of a painting or in front of any type of art form. Uh, I don't know if there's uh, a particular predisposition required. Do you think there is? Or do you think that's possible? I guess it's, I guess with all artwork, we try to come with an open mind. And um, I guess when you view different works of art, you see from a different, maybe art can show you um, viewing from a different point of view and maybe uh, learning something about yourself as well. That's how we come to it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's good to go with an empty mind, but um, I don't know if that's always possible. Um, if you had a very difficult day and then you go to a gallery, uh, hopefully the work will help you to get there. Um, but of course, uh, the less, the more one tries to not apply a sort of amount of judgments while experiencing work, the more one can learn from it, in my opinion. Do you? I saw, oh, sorry, B. Go oh, ahead. Go ahead, Annie. No, I, I checked out um, Claire's Instagram page, and I, there was an image that really struck me, and it was um, almost like a it's a de deconstruction of a face, and I really liked that idea of uh, it's. I mean, you could view it either way of the construction, but I saw it more of the deconstruction, and I found that a very 
um, thought-provoking, Claire. And what what was your thought behind that that image? Uh, if you can remember, it's, it seems to be an image, just one image, where it shows, you know, each there's a, each piece of uh, the image is taken away to almost where you're left with oh, yeah. with nothing. Yeah, I really. I looked at yeah. you know everything that you had on your page, but that for me really um, I don't know that spoke to me more. I don't know why. Maybe it's because of where I'm at with myself uh, that it really I thought oh, I really like that. That's the deconstruction to nothingness almost. That yeah. I wonder why because that seems to be the only piece that you've got up there that I could see that was drawn. Um, and not a conceptual where you've, um, sorry, forgive that word if it is conceptual, where you've uh, put placement and used physical objects instead of, you know, using uh, drawing or painting, you know, that's that, that sort of visual. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that piece, I, I know what you're talking about. I think it actually is probably the only thing I still have on Instagram from before I entered at Art Academy, actually. Oh, okay. Um, and um, it actually came, it's actually two images, uh, one in which the, the images propose a sort of construction. So you start from nothing and you get to an image of a face. And then yeah. the other image which goes with it goes in a deconstruction. From, so from something to nothing. Um, and they, those drawings were actually made, I was making a sculpture by carving out this face from a block. And then at every different steps of the process, I stopped and made a sketch with chart. Um, and then I collaged uh, these different images into one digital format, which was printed large scale, and they belonged to each other. Um, so this sort of process of construction of a sort of identity I see it as a, from nothing to a sort of constructed character and then the process from the constructed character back to nothing. Um, so, well, I think that can be quite um, a direct representation of a sort of construction of an ego or a separate self or a persona and then the process of deconstruction or letting go of that self-identification where slowly you lose uh, different bits of your character and start identifying with the background which first hosts you and then becomes you. Um, but I, I quite like the fact that they both belong to each other because on one hand I think that the first part of the process in which there's deconstruction of the character is somehow essential for the second part to be possible. Um, so I, I quite value the relevance of both um, construction and deconstruction. I think there wouldn't be much to deconstruct if we didn't first contract, construct a whole ego or character to then deconstruct. Um, yeah, it reminds me a bit of this. Uh, I, I just finished writing my thesis. And then I argument also quite a bit around language and how the use of language sort of um, sustains this idea we have of linear time uh, and how we tend to take names of things as if they were the real thing. Um, and we lose the sense of the actual experience we have in the present moment of that thing once we take those concepts for reality. So I explained all this idea in this uh, philosophical, so to say, chapter. And then my, my uh, uh, relator for the thesis then put this little comment at the end of it and says, yes, but it's via the use of language that we can have an experience of absence of language. Um, oh, yeah. So I thought it was a nice little touch on how, of course, you can complain about the existence of language, but we wouldn't know that we are having an experience of non-language without that layer existing. 
I thought that was an interesting comment to my whole non-dual philosophical, put in a philosophical sense chapter. Then she finalized by saying like, yes, I agree, but it's essential to have that first layer you're trying to free yourself from. Um, yeah, I thought that was a nice comment. <laughs> Thank you. That after, I think that explains it. And I, I love what you've just said. Absolutely. How would we know language if we didn't know language? How would we yeah. know no language? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. I, I really well, love it. It really did speak a lot to me. So, you know, that was, yeah, I enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> nice you say so. Yeah. Yeah, and on one hand, I find it interesting that the the one thing you spoke the most of or that most touched you was the only two-dimensional piece I actually have on my Instagram page, uh, which is something I'm not really doing anymore, actually. I'm not really drawing at all the last years, and I'm way more into uh, material uh, and 3D experiences. Um, but probably the other ones also, they are 2D versions of 3D experiences on Instagram. So probably you can't really experience it. Which makes and connect it with it. And I guess, yeah, I think it's where I'm at with myself that maybe I, you know, I'm having a slight deconstruction and a reconstruction. And I think that's why that was, it sort of pushed itself out. And the more I looked at it, it was like, oh yeah, I can see where it's, you're coming to nothing, but also where you're actually, you know, going going the other way. So yeah, that that I found that very yeah, it, that is what spoke to me the most. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. I just have a question. Um, when you talk about um, what is meant by uh, familiar things become magical by displacement. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, on one hand, I think um, it relates to what I was saying about language um, in a sense that I think that the more we know something or we are used to it, it kind of becomes ordinary just because we are so accustomed to see it. You might drink tea every morning, um, but you kind of forget of how amazing that flavor is. Um, so I think how those are familiar things. And once in my artworks, I think I try to uh, displace or uh, invite for a new perspective in which you can still drink that tea, but I'm kind of reminded you that uh, by making you drink it upside down or by displacing your usual habit um, of approaching that situation or that phenomena, that it actually is um, magical by itself. So it's not that I'm putting magic on the thing, but by changing how you look at it, I hope to awaken the fact that you love that tea and that it's actually magical by itself. So in that sense, by displacing either the phenomena or the way you look at it, I try to unveil the fact that that thing has already an intrinsic magical layer to it. Or, yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting, and it's I think it fits into that uh, deconstruction and construction uh, process. You know how we, as humans, seek uh, certainty, and we kind of put things together in, in a certain way and then we become used to it and then it just becomes a sort of a, a habit and within that habit we derive a sense of safety. So I guess my question is when one approaches your art or, or when you're um, creating art, is there a sense, how do you explore that, um, that place of uncertainty, that unknown? As, as an artist and um, what do you, is there an in, intention to have the, the viewer um, 
uh, kind of take that risk or, 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 or put things in place to, to break them out of that sense of certainty? Yeah, I think that's um, a big part, both of my work and of my practice. And I think it takes a, a slightly, or I approach it a bit differently when it's about me doing it in the process of making. So accepting a certain level of uncertainty and not knowing what's gonna happen and where the work is going in the process of making. Um, and that's like, it's not always so easy um, in the sense that there's something really magical and beautiful about not knowing where something is going. But on the other hand, as you were saying, we look for certain certainties. So it's really comfortable when I think I know what I'm doing, uh, but it's also really limiting the process. Uh, so I try to spot it in my own head. You know, I, when I think I really know, then I'm like, no, wait a second. If you accept the fact that you don't know, then it's going to go much more it's gonna become more exciting and it has infinite possibilities instead of having one possibility that I think it has to go there. Um, and when you, you asked, I think more about how I relate to the idea of a viewer and this feeling of the viewer not knowing once he enters um, the space, I think that is quite an essential part uh, of my work in the sense that I personally think that if you enter a situation and at some point what you think has to go in a certain way suddenly goes differently, you're suddenly way more brought to presence and you're sent because you're suddenly physically like, wait, what's going on here? It's not going how I think it should go. So you're suddenly like physically really curious of exploring and you don't know. And that brings a certain like, whoa, let's see how that goes. Like, for example, I made a series of works which um, I have quite a like classical shape, like paintings and sculptures, but then they come with a label, which looks like a really normal label that usually you have underneath the work, but then the label invites you to touch the painting. So that has a similar subtle displacement in the sense that you start looking at it and you might think certain things and then you read the label to see what the medium is and then you're like whoa I can touch it I didn't know suddenly it's this like new mysterious experience of like closing your eyes and touching a painting um so on that sense I think the displacement or when it's an immersive experience and you just open the door and you expect an exposition and suddenly there's it's dark and there are video projections and things are happening and there are sculptures and suddenly the floor is full of sand and then you're like whoa wait a second and you have to kind of jump instinctively to presence to figure out what's happening so in that sense i find it a very powerful tool to create a situation in which the viewer doesn't know anymore what's happening um, because it suddenly pulls you out of that ordinary mindset and you suddenly are here yeah, i'm here and i don't know what's happening so that's exciting yeah. somehow yeah and and i wonder if you could comment on it seems like there's also a sort of um um i don't i don't know if it's it's the the objects you use or how you do it but it seems like there's an anchor there as well for the person to um, kind of um, focus on in, in, a, in a sense. Uh, and um, that maybe enables them to take uh, that risk, you know, to, to really, like there, it seems like there's something there to hold on. Like even with, with the words, you know, you, you talk in your, uh, the bio about the word. So that's a known thing. And then I was going along with it and the words point back to yourself, you know? Um, so I, I, so I just wonder if you could comment on that. Are there, are there anchors and, and are those anchors moved? Mm. Well, on one hand, I think that not knowing or displacement 
can be really scary if there's no anchor. Uh, if you enter a room and suddenly imagine it's a full pitch dark and someone pushes you in and says you have to go inside and then someone starts poking you but you don't see it. I'm just fantasizing of this type of experience. Uh, then you are still brought to presence uh, but you're freaky scared. Um, so that's so, and you have no anchor, you have nothing to cling to, you just want to find the door to get out of it. So you're going to breathe in presence, but you're not going to like it. It's not like, it's not like a comfy bed on which you lay, it's like full of spikes and that's not nice. <laughs> and then you're going to have like a bad present experience, so to say. Um, and I think that happens when there's no anchor, as you were saying, like there's nothing you can relate to and cling to. Um, whether on one hand, yeah, I think it is important to keep something that makes the experience remain something um, that can displace, but relate to you, so to say. Um, so I don't know, I see it also in a process, like when I'm making certain things and then I have to, I try to embrace the fact that I don't know where things are going. But at the same time in the process, I need at some point to know something. Otherwise I'm not gonna go anywhere. I think that's a similar process. Like I, if, I, if for example, I don't know uh, if you're painting, it's maybe a more simple example. You need to at some point choose that red is the right color and you're gonna go with that. Because if you don't go with anything and you're just constantly in the not knowing, you're just lost. You're, you're lost totally. Whether at some point there's something you have to stick to. And that's how you sort of, I don't know, I find it, I read once on this website like that the process of making art, it's true that you deal with not knowing, but it's also that every work turns out from all those possibilities something concrete. So you do try to know something, then it's not maybe a linear or logical knowledge, but there is always this like, it does give some kind of anchor itself, I think, the experience of art. It kind of helps you to embrace not knowing, but it anchors you in that experience. So it's safe somehow, which I think is interesting. I think also even with the not knowing, you can also come across things that are new that you uh, kind of come, you know, when you make a choice, like, as you say, clear, you choose, let's say you go with red or you choose something and you have to, because in that moment you need it to go forward in whatever way, shape or form, but you're not sure you have to. And sometimes amazing things can come from that because newer things, you're pushing your boundaries yeah. and you're seeing your unlimitlessness and where you can go even further. So I like that because what you do is you challenge your viewer to come have a look. Yes, you know, you've got your anchor, but see if you can explore more. When I read your profile, I thought I love that idea of, you know, landscapes just hanging. Oh my God, imagine looking in the sky and just seeing, oh wow, where did that come from? Like a landscape just hanging in there because, you know, we can walk past them every day as you say it's like walking past a phone box you know that the phone box is on the side of the road but if you see it just hanging up on the side of a building you're like whoa what is that doing there why is that there you know you kind of come out of your everyday mundane thinking and you start thinking outside of the box and from thinking outside of the box opens another world of possibilities so when I read that uh, of what you wrote I thought I really love that and I really want to see your work because I really like that. You're pushing yourself, but you're also pushing your viewer to look outside of everything that we believe to be is normal. And, you know, we have, we forgot how tea tastes because we just drink it. We don't think, you know, wow, this, you know, we don't drink it as if it's the first time we're drinking it. it that's how it is but that that's forgive you that's how I took what you had written and I thought that's very exciting that's an exciting uh for the viewer and also it must be very exciting for you Claire because you you never know how your work is going to uh progress and where you where you yourself will end up with it yeah so yeah thank you so much <laughs> 
Yeah, it's lovely to see that. You, you're welcome. I, I like that. That's a very open, uh, 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 an open way of, uh, of, you know, standing and looking at the sunset is not just that. It's a little bit more than that. So I like that. I love the way that creative people perceive things outside of everything. I just think it's, a wonderful place to be and a wonderful thing to do so yeah thank you that's uh, beautiful and that goes for you Ade too and for you Brian too the creativity that takes us outside of ourselves and invites our viewers to go outside and to think outside of you know what we believe is our normality so so that's my philosophical philosophical piece today sorry <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. How do you relate to this um what what um Annie was talking about of this uh dealing with uh not knowing and constantly because I think it is an interesting limbo because they really need to kind of knowing and not knowing in an artistic practice, I think they need to embrace each other. You can't just not know all the time and you can't just know all the time. And it's a quite an interesting, delicate limbo. Like you can't run, you can't play the guitar if you forget the notes. I mean, you can, but it's gonna be different. It's gonna be a different research. At the same time, if you know the notes and then you forget about them, you're gonna probably make something extraordinary with the guitar because you're gonna discover fake middle tones that you wouldn't do if you were strictly applying chords. Uh, but I'm wondering if you guys, how, how do you personally deal it in your own practice? Annie? Sorry, B, I was waiting for, I mean, for myself, Clara, I really I love that. what you said. So, um, with with whatever I'm doing, it is exactly that. So if you don't take that step and that choice to go forward, um, and again with especially when you're painting, um, I don't use Photoshop, so everything is done, you know, physically at that time at that moment. You have to choose whether to, um, you know, if it's pleasing to yourself. And I've had many a time when colors have gone oh my god that doesn't look right but then you have to work through it as you say Claire said and I'm sure the rest of you have found you know that you work through it you add more color you change the color and you know nine times out of ten I come out with something even more uh, pleasing than the road I know and the road I travel all the time the color mixing that I know you know that is okay that has become your palette and, you know, you step back and you think, wow, I did that. You know, I did that because I, I kept on with it. Um, so I'm sure that will be with writing, with, um, you know, filmmaking, with, you know, just ideas and, and even nuclear. You know, when you, when you make choices, of course, there are going to be things that are displeasing to your own eye. But somebody else might come along and say, oh, I really, I really like that. that. I really like that. But, but for me aesthetically it hasn't come out the way I wanted it and it's not aesthetically uh, pleasing to me but that doesn't mean that it's not a success that's what I've learned with pushing and moving forward um, and but there's still a beauty in everything that you create I don't know if that answers um, what you were what you were saying Claire so that's why what you wrote really spoke spoke to me and it was like yeah I really like that that you know, that's really on point, exactly that. You know, sometimes it's good not to know where you're going, but you need a yin and a yang, a balance of the limbo and the knowing, and there has to be a union where it comes together and you move forward and that's how you progress. And that's how I guess you learn more about your abilities uh, of, you know, what you're capable of and what, you know, what, what you don't know you're, capable of and, and what your qualities are and you know I guess having looked at other artists the very old artists the one that comes to mind is Picasso I was absolutely blown away by how many uh, forms of art he had tried but not just tried pushed himself through and I thought wow that that is 
fantastic because that is really pushing yourself, your abilities every which way out of yourself. It's like pushing yourself out of your skin as Brian is always telling me, expressing it, expressing it out. I, I was so amazed at how many levels that he had produced artwork. I was ashamed actually of myself because I only thought that he produced these blue people in the 80s, you know, these Picasso's people moving. I was, you know, absolutely, um, yeah, in awe of his work. So, sorry. So I hope that answers from where I from where I am of, um, you know, how you move forward. Are they? Um, well, it's just listening to you all is inspiring. <laughs> I'll, I'll first start with that. Makes me want to. Uh, go out and, and create something. Um, so for me, venturing into that place of the unknown, um, it's, it's difficult in life. <clears throat> I'm a sort of routine type of person um, because I like to feel safe. I mean, it, it, I do it to the point like where I have water on one side and coffee on the other side you know, the exact same way every day. And, um, it, and it, it really gets, um, the, but the idea of changing it up scares me, of uh, changing my routines up. So, but when I write something or like if I'm writing poetry, it's like, it's my chance to just express uh, freely and, um, and it's really exciting because I never know where it's going to go. And, um, you know, I just start with a word, like you said, you got to start with, with something. Um, and, and then, you know, it, it just kind of uh, works itself out somehow. Um, also, <clears throat> these, uh, Ron was mentioning the, um, the kind of comedy news uh, show that I've been doing. And um, that's all improv. And so I, I, I have the idea of the character and I use kind of, I use stuff animals basically. And, um, and so I put the, 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 uh, the, the character somewhere and then I do the interview, you know, and, and I do both voices. So it's, when I do those, I really, really feel like a kid. And so one of the things, ways of approaching the unknown uh, or uncertainty for me is playfulness, allowing myself the space to be uh, playful, which is comes with it for me, this feeling that I'm being irresponsible you know, and that just comes from maybe some of it was what I've interpreted from what my parents were teaching, not that they did that intentionally. Part of it is from what I was uh, conditioned with by society and by school. You have to do everything in a certain way. And so um, even in uh, my art classes and film classes, um, you know, they had a certain structure and especially in the film classes, you have to do this, this way. Some of the professors, not all of them. Um, and, and which is good to have certain boundaries and then um, kind of work outside of them as well. So I would say uh, playfulness um, in when I'm making art. That's what that's when I when I allow, allow myself to be playful. So that's how I approach the uncertainty, and I think I can use that more in my life. You know, I, I don't do that uh, enough. You know, maybe when I'm playing with my kids, uh, you know, I'm able to to express that more, but. Um, it really is one way to step into that uh, unknown you know, for me. Yeah, yeah that sounds lovely. Ahead, 
yeah, oh, sorry, it sounds quite um, inspiring because I think a lot of people, I also have certain routines or rituals to sort of like balance themselves out and um, which can be really precious uh, because, uh, and some are just given, especially I imagine if you have a child, there's certain things that just have to become in a sort of like routine. He has to go to bed at a certain time and go to school at a certain time and be picked up and so forth. So that's a certain aspect of life that I don't think we can just like, I'm just never gonna do the same thing every day. That's just not always possible. Um, but I think it's interesting how you talk about how art making is kind of like, it's a space you create inside of that routine because you are going to have to plan like, okay, now I have this afternoon in which I'm going to do this improvised video in which then playfulness comes in and unknown has space. So you kind of schedule it. You, have, you need to because life can be extremely, so you schedule time to be absolutely free. I find that uh, an inspiring <laughs> Um, I don't know, also advice for whoever feels uh, stuck inside of a sort of like given life structure to prepare a certain time in which you can not know what's going to happen for five hours only. It reminds me a bit of like um, Muji's meditation, um, Invitation to Freedom. I don't know if you've done that. And at some point he says like... Um, I'm going to ask you to leave all past and future behind just for now, just for the time of this meditation, of this inquiry. They're going to come and pick you up afterwards. But just for now, just leave it all behind. Uh, it's somehow similar, like, OK, now I'm going to do this improvised video. For now, I cannot know anything. <laughs> it's uh, somehow related. I think. Well, there, you know, it's what you were saying, just... Um, brought up, you know, a question, uh, you know, or just, just a thought, and maybe you could uh, comment on this. Um, this, this stepping into the, the unknown, um, and maybe the fear connected with it and, or the seeking the, the known, um, you know, brings up the question, do we really even, it seems like the artwork is more in alignment with truth because do we really know what's, what's, um, what's known? Like, do we really, you know, so maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I, if I, if someone else wants to say, maybe I'm chatting a lot too much. Um, I have the feeling often that like, we feel like we've understood something once something is finished. So once a poem is written and then you read it and then something comes to you, it can be a feeling, it doesn't have to be an intellectual understanding, but it feels like something is understood through that poem. And then I find it so interesting when you give that poem to read to someone else and they understood something totally else. And maybe they got a really different feeling from it just because we have this personal story or background that does give an influence on how we intake reality. Um, and I find that quite interesting on how I feel like I know something but it's absolutely relative. Like it's it's not true in a sense. Like I did know something on my side and it's still valuable, but it's not like an absolute truth. I find it always interesting when I go to like expositions and today it's so much this thing about explaining the work. And there's this whole explanation about what, why that wants to talk about it. And sometimes I just, I never read it as first thing. Sometimes I do read them. And then I had this totally other feeling and then I read the text and it's something totally different. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting how they thought they really knew that thing, but what I know, it's different. I don't know if that, if that refers to what you were saying. Maybe I understood the question wrong. No, it, it, yeah, it, it does. You, you, you brought up um, 
the the question of um, a perspective and uh, subjectivity and um, and and I think that's it, it seems like that's what your work is pointing at in, in some ways is it gives the the viewer um, by creating this sort of I don't know if abstract is the is the right uh, word, but things not in their um, what we call normal uh, place. So it may be more difficult to to fit things together, and and in for some reason that sort of um, since we're not in that usual condition, that sort of um, react reactionary uh, state, you know, where where it's kind of a knee jerk reaction, in terms of how we're relating with the world, then there's a little bit of space open enough to turn back within, and maybe it, it's it's a little bit, it can be a little bit frustrating, as well because it is working a sort of a, a different muscle in a way, um, but, but bringing the attention uh, back to the, the subject, was it, which is that uh, presence that you, that you talk about. Yeah, I see what you mean that it can be a bit, like ideally it's a bit a frustrating situation in which suddenly things just don't go the right way, but or the ordinary way. But on one hand, like um, this last installation I made, you have the room is full of sand, and then you have these different ropes uh, that hang down, and they, they they become sort of pendles with these little balls of clay. And but inside the clay and underneath the earth, there's a magnet system that's playing so that you would expect the pendle to go straight but then it reaches the point and it just doesn't go so it would do like this so you think it's gonna do like this but then it gets here and it goes backwards and then it goes this way so you really don't know how it's going so it's a subtle like um and there are different elements inside of this installation that create a sort of like, it should go one way, just gravity should go one way, but it just doesn't. Or you have these other ropes that are hanging like this, and this is the ground, and there's nothing that keeps it out of gravity. There's a magnet that keeps it out of gravity, but they're not attached. So the, the rope is just dangling like this, and, you, and you're like, why, why does it go that way? But on one hand, I feel that it actually, it's. A, I feel for lots of people that enter the installation, it's a sort of relief instead of being frustrating, as you were saying. There's also a kind of relief and calmness in the fact that, I don't really know why that happens, but that things are not going the right way or the ordinary way, but they are going. So maybe that's an anchor itself. Like, it's not that the thing is falling all the time and it doesn't, it works, but it doesn't work how it should. So it's somehow not distressful, but it's sort of calming somehow because you're in a space where you don't know, but it's, it works. It's not that you're lost in darkness. Like, it doesn't go how you think it should, but it's going, so it's probably fine that it goes how you don't know it goes. I don't know. Maybe that creates. Yeah, sort of that, that. yeah, that's that's great because it's it's like a um, a safe space to experience that. Whereas in your life, there you may feel more of a sense of uh, risk to your personal, you know, security and and things like that. Um, and there is oh another question is. I noticed that in some of the installations you count. So could you can you talk about? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, they, well, this counting thing came out the last month. I actually had it in my head for ages. And then I said, I'm just gonna try it out. I don't know why, but I'm just gonna put it in. Um, it's, I find it interesting because in the whole installation, I count, uh, up to uh, 60, so one minute, 
but it takes me eight minutes and a half to get to 60. Wow. Um, and the rhythm in which I count, it absolutely doesn't make sense because it's totally subjective. So when I record it, I'm sitting in the installation and there are these things swinging and I'm just counting one minute in my own subjective sense of time. So then it would go like one, two, three, four, five, six. So it creates that kind of gap in which you expect things to go in a linear sense. So you expect that with the same rhythm, there would be one, then there's two, and then there's a gap. And three comes where six should be. And in that moment, you're left with the sign of like, I'm expecting it to go, but it doesn't. It's kind of like with the pendos. I expect it to get here, but it goes back. <laughs> it's a similar. Um, so it, I think it refers also to what you were saying about this, like um, subjectivity, like giving space for a sort of subjective, in this case, a subjective sense of time, uh, which then takes us back to presence. In that case, time one minute is seven minutes and and one second becomes 10 seconds and and there's a sort of like given wrong time which doesn't match with your own sense of time in your head and I think all these recalls to times somehow put you back to presence I feel there's this kind of gap between what you expect and what is actually happening that kind of gives you this empty space to be with the work somehow. I think that's a bit my idea about this counting, but I am going to continue with, with this. And uh, I think there's going to be some kind of counting development that might come up in which maybe they're going to be different voices counting at different times, um, at different volumes from different corners of the space. I don't know exactly yet, but I think it's, but that's a bit the idea where it comes from is a bit to give space to one's subjective sense of time. So then present, but we have this sense of time, sort of time. Claire, you know what just came for me when you just said that? I don't know if your installations are, as you speak there, is it just audio? Because in place of the audio could be a projection of that number. So again, that is really going to, throw a spanner in the works for your viewer so your counting can be one two three and instead of saying four you visually show the four and maybe say the five but visually show a six seven do you see what I mean it it it, it for me would take that out of the counting but I really like that because again you're pushing your viewer because you're taking them out of that that expectedness you know and as Ade, said, Ade says, because I really connect with what Ade says in routine, you're routinely expecting the schedule to be, you know, the same. So, yeah, that, I like that, that pushing it a bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see how you, how the, the presence of visible numbers could become something I start playing with. It's Thank you. the confusion of that. So they're going to expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the break that's something but maybe chuck in something else maybe a visual I don't know it may but that's what came to me for you when when you were when you were speaking yeah thank you <laughs> no you're welcome you're welcome I just I just you know thinking about your art you know I was, I was thinking about it uh yesterday and, and today it's such I mean, for me such an important um it's really important to have it there for people to to experience um, because you know a life is filled with the unexpected and it can sometimes um, kind of throw us um, you know th like throw us off balance you know kind of turn shake up our our, our world and, and then we try really hard and so, you know, to put things back. And, uh, and you see this in, in the world now, how it, it can cause, it can be a, a place where um, there, can, there can be a lot of tension, a lot of power struggle, 
and, and things of, of this nature, because everybody's trying to get things to fit in the way that they want it to achieve a certain um, sense of safety. Now, the I think it's important for people to be able to experience this um, that 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 the universe or, or, or the world is, is filled with um, things that are unexpected, but that but but it doesn't mean that it's against us. You know, it doesn't mean that that we're not going to be uh, taken care of, and 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 so having artwork like this and, and artists uh, creating these things for us to step into that that world and and experience this, I think it's it's a key thing, you know, in in, in like in music as well, and in, in all these different uh, ways where where we can um, explore this. Um, this sort of uh, truth, you know, so I, I really uh, appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, I think it applies like not only to what I make, but to the nature of art itself. Um, only the fact that we can all stand in front of a painting, as we were saying before, and feel differently. It's already a sort of demonstration that there's not a static truth. The truth is not so static, so to say, that things are relative. And itself, I think that's something that it's quite like embedded in the essence of what art is. I mean, I think we live in a society in which most things are sort of like fields of human <laughs> expression in which we sort of tend to apply a system. So of course, then one can say that physics, inside of physics does question itself and it's not so static and rigid, but how we are taught it, it's like, this is true. What science tells us is true. What informatics tells us is true. And it's sort of rigid how we are taught to take that knowledge. Whether art itself, I think, um, can show us that things are not so solid and the truth is not such a statement and that and that as you were saying that it's it's okay that that's amazing actually that things are not so solid and static um, yeah I don't know as a yeah I think that's a key word uh, show us um, and for, for me it's it gives a uh, another perspective kind of opens up a, a, another eye, another a view on things, you know, um, where a lot of times in terms of, um, you know, day-to-day -day living, things may not go the way that we want to, but they are in a sort of, you know, use the word a divine, sort of divine order. Many times we miss it. You know, so we don't, so we don't see it. You know, we're, we're um, I don't know if you ever heard of the, the teacher, uh, Ramana Maharshi. So he has a, a saying um, about letting go, surrender. So when it, you know, he says, if you're taking a train and you're carrying the luggage, let's say that the universe or higher power, whatever you want to call uh, is the train. So would you go on the train and carry the luggage while you're riding the train? Or would you just let the, you know, put the baggage down and enjoy the ride? It's going in the destination anyway. So why carry the, the luggage? And so, <laughs> so with, our, with our, our burdens and the way that I think that things go and am I going to be taken care of, um, that I'm not enjoying uh, the ride. So, so the so art, in a way, allows me to enjoy the ride. To 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 open up. It it opens up a, a realm of um, infinite possibilities and ways of of seeing things. You know, so that's that's important. I find. 
I think that's great because how you see it, Ade, is different to how I see it. So how Claire sees it is different to me and, and uh, to Brian. So what you bring to the table is going to open my eyes up because, wow, I didn't even think of that. What Claire brings is like, whoa, that's even, man, that's, it's so important that, you know, we have all this versatility, that we have all these different eyes that are thinking in a different way and also out of the box, but in a different way to how Ade thinks out of the box, to how I think out of the box, to how Brian does uh, and to how Claire does. It's it, it absolutely uh, really uh, important and imperative that that's, stays alive because we're continually being uh, fed uh, different ideas, different concepts that are outside of what we believe. And as Claire said, you know, what we think is, oh, yeah. And again, is it is it important that what you paint or create is understood exactly the way that you wanted it created? I don't know. Is that in, as important as uh, if how your viewer and what your viewer takes from that for their personal benefit. That's a question to all of you guys, um, how you see when you're creating your work. Is it important or is it that you want your viewer to take whatever they take from it and learn and push themselves from that? So I'm asking, are they clear? And you, Brian, that question. Clear? Yeah. Um, is, is the importance of your work being understood and as Claire rightly said you know when they give you a write-up of this piece and blah 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 blah, blah, blah. is it important that's <laughs> sorry because I know what my <laughs> answer is you know is it important for your viewer to have absolutely understood you uh, that means dotting all of the I's and crossing all of the T's of what you have expressed out onto whatever form your art form is, that they understood absolutely. Are you tied to that? I'm asking all of you as creative people, are you tied to that? Um, shall I go first? Someone else wants to go. A any any um, of you? Well, I, I must say I thought a lot about this, um, especially because in Art Academy at the beginning you it's a lot about talking about things. And we and then we always have this small group of people that gather in a room and someone shows something. And then uh, at some point, actually the first year we did these, uh, that one set it up a room with his works, then a group of 10 people walks inside and we just start talking about it. And the artist whose work is there can't talk, just listens. Um, and once I remember we had this, uh, it's called curatorial practice. And then we, we had one of these moments and and this girl had this whole installation with these plastic uh, and this video of the sea and these casts of plastic pieces. And then, um, and we spent like half an hour talking about pollution and environmental problems because there was this plastic and the sea and we all made that connection that this was a critique about pollution and environmental problems. Um, and then once she could, was allowed to talk after 45 minutes of us waffling about pollution, she said, I really didn't think about pollution in any phase of my artistic process. This was not about pollution to me. Um, so I think it's a good example in the sense that on one hand, no, it's not important what people think about it. But on the other hand, I think, at least in my experience, that um, if you don't want to make a critique about pollution, and then it's so clear that to everyone there the work is about pollution, then it's good that you are aware about it. And that if you were talking about the intimate relation you can have when touching a piece of plastic, then maybe the manifestation of your intentions, it's not as sharp as it could be. Um, so on one hand, I think it's a balance between the two things in the sense that, of course, anyhow, anyone is going to see something and feel something a bit different. But if when that intention is clear to you, 
Mm, then probably what you make is gonna more closely transmit what you want to put in the world. If you want to put in the world an energy of, uh, as in my case, uh, something that mirrors presence, uh, but then when people enter my installations, they are afraid because it's too dark uh, and they, they have a really fearful experience, then it's a good reaction that I know that maybe there's something I can change in how I'm working. Um, and anyhow, like I was making these sculptures to be touched uh, uh, with lots of curves and things to be like touched and explored. And then one girl once entered and said, I find them really scary because I'm afraid of putting my fingers in holes since I was a child. So fine, that's something I can't predict. Uh, most people really enjoyed the contemplative experience and then she was really afraid of the sculptures. I think that gives a sense, but I think there's a good balance in how if what people react on your work is so super different from your intention, then it can be just a good feedback of improving the way in which you manifest your own ideas. That's a bit how I think of it. But then of course, everyone will always have a slightly different opinion, but the more sharp it is, how you manifest your intentions, the more I think it will be somehow unified the reaction you get not the same but in a sort of same energy field so to say that the work will transmit a more clear intention then i will see blue and you will see dark blue and you will see slight bluish purple but potentially really few people will see feel bright orange so to say i don't know if that gives us sense yeah that makes sense that makes sense and ade and and b on on how are you how do you guys ade? Uh, yeah how, uh, and for you b how how are you with people uh perceiving your your work are you attached to um them understanding implicitly what you were trying to uh purvey over or are you not as attached to um, the outcome of your viewer or listener? I guess the aim is to, I guess, put across an idea that I'm working on. But sometimes at, at the time of doing it, I don't even understand what it is, what's going on. And I think as well, there are layers. So you produce a work and somebody reads it at the age of 12 and it means one thing to them at 12. They read it again at 25 and it means something else at 25. They read it at 40 and it means something else. And I think I've been inspired by a lot of artists who, when I can watch their work or their films or their music four, five, six, seven, eight times and I realize something new. I've heard something new and also something new has come out of me, but I've seen it eight, nine times. So I think in that way, it's to, it's great to have layers and that way of working keeps you, keeps you fresh, keeps the reader, listener, they're fresh as well because they can always come into it in a new way. They're always discovering something new. So, I guess it's not that it's always understood. I guess I'm trying to get a point along, a point across, but it's layered. And even myself, I've written things. And a year later, I've read it back. And then I say, I understand where I was going. I didn't then, I had vague concepts, but I didn't fully understand. Now I can finish the work because I know what it was I was talking about, or I know the road I was on, but at the time I didn't know. I hadn't met that person yet. I hadn't had that conversation yet. I hadn't read that book yet. I hadn't had this awakening of something yet. Now I can go into it. So I think, yeah, just the idea of multi-layered work. So maybe it's not fully understood at the time, but it can be gone back to. 
Ade? Ade? So the, the question is, do, do I um, uh, care if someone gets what it is, I'm, you know, what my intention was or, or you know, gets the point of... Yeah, are, are you attached to it? Are you attached to um, your viewer be, getting, uh, totally understanding where you're coming from in your work, you know, totally getting it or are you, um, you know, more open to whatever they... Um, whatever they get from watching your work you know from you know you're a lot more less attached to that mm. good question um i don't you know, maybe part of it is the type of work i'm doing as well you know if, if it's a narrative film versus a painting you know if i'm doing an abstract uh, painting then it's open to so many interpretations and like I don't even know <laughs> what, yeah. what it what it is. I like that answer. That's, that's, that's yeah. what it's yeah, like. So. You can't argue with that. It's like, hey, that you know. Yeah, so sometimes they, they say something that sounds quite beautiful, and, and I'm thinking, wow, yeah, I think that's what I meant to do. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, but if it's a narrative uh, film where I've like worked on the script, uh, you know, quite a bit, and worked on the characters and put a lot of time and effort and then I'm sitting in a screening room watching it and um, someone doesn't get a certain part or interprets it a certain way. Sometimes there is, you know, within myself, um, this, oh no, they didn't get it. Or you don't get a laugh where you thought their laugh should be. And um you know, so it, it, it can be just a pointer to go back and maybe I'm not conveying something the way, like does, is it necessary that this needs to, I need to get a certain reaction at, at, at this point in the film? Is it necessary to the whole, you know, the story? And, um, or is it really a place that's open to a lot of interpretation? You know, so it's it's kind of, being able to put some distance uh, to it as well. Um, so yeah, I guess the answer is uh, yes and no. And and there, there, there's a part that, um, you know, a, as an artist and um, I, I want uh, someone to, to get what it is I'm trying to e express, you know, um, especially, especially if it's my poetry, I, I tend to, like, if I share my poetry, sometimes people will interpret it like, oh, is everything okay, you know? And, and I have felt like, wow, it came from this place of, of really freeing myself and doing this sort of inner work and, and, and so it, there was this beauty and this joy and everything in it. And the response is, I'll get a, a, a message on Facebook. How is everything? I, I just read your poem. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you know, total different reaction. And I, I want to say, no, you don't get it. But, you know, I, I, I just don't, I just say everything's okay. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's weird how people can interpret the, um, you know, things uh, differently. And, and I can... I can understand that. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, so I think that's it. <laughs> I like that. Everybody gave a great answer. That was, that was, it's interesting because as creative people, I guess, you know, there is a part of you that's thinking, you know, I wonder if somebody else is going to get it. But I find for myself, the older I've got, the less attached I am to if I, anybody understands it. Or, or is uh, I'm less attached to oh yeah you know can they make out what I'm doing um, I just find that I'm more interested in has it pleased me and am I pleased with the outcome is that quite a narcissistic way to be or is that just self growth I don't know I think when I was a lot younger not dissimilar to Claire we were really taught you know to sit in groups and discuss and I think I've just maybe just it it is getting older, I'm less um, 
I'm less tied to what somebody else thinks of it and I'm more about just doing it and I'm quite amazed if somebody does like it because I've really done it to please myself so is that I don't know is that a good way to be is that I don't know is that a a, a way forward I can really is that, that quite, quite a regressive <laughs> I, I think that's, um, you know, I can relate to that part of it as, as well. And, um, you know, there's actually a film that I did, two in particular, that, um, you know, didn't get the responses I thought that it should get. <laughs> because, like, it, I, I made the film and it combines different uh, mediums and, and, and things. And I just thought, you know it's, I really felt it in my whole body and soul. And it just, I loved it. And I share that in crickets, you know, nothing. And then there's something else that I thought was oh, mediocre and, and people love it. But what you said about what's important and, and I watched that film, and this is going to sound narcissistic, but but I I watch it sometimes, or and I just feel like because it's uh, for me it's like a meditation, and I just enjoy it, you know. So maybe it it is partly um, for yourself in a way as well. So I don't see anything wrong with that, you know, finding no, that, that you joy. Right, it's almost it's almost cathartic. So it get just getting it out of you as, as Brian's always say express it so for you me clear whatever if somebody doesn't like it it's so pleasing to you because you've actually got it out of you yet yeah, as you've just said Ade a really mediocre piece to you is like wow how did you do that Ade wow mad that's great whoa clear mad and you're looking at it you think you really really I poured out a mediocre part of myself, really? And you're going to say, that's great. This is what I poured everything into. And you don't think that this is a golden globe moment. No, that, that can't be right. So I think, you know, I guess maybe I've just come to that part of, you know, some things are going to pick, you know, some, some things people are going to pick up and say, wow, that's really great. But a lot of our work is just us expressing ourselves. And it's us letting out whatever we're going through whatever is going on in our mind whatever we're you know whatever and I guess every piece is going to be a bit of that and some are going to speak more in volumes and others less I guess in the level of whatever way shape or form you're expressing. Claire do you have I won't say last words but do you have any words to begin the next stage to? Um, any words? What do you mean to begin the next stage? Uh, from when we leave this conversation to what we go out for our next art projects, whatever you're doing next. Um, I would invite uh, to seek for joy while making. I find it very important and to judge your own work on the basis of how much it makes you happy. I think that that's a nice criteria. Um, sometimes I think in my experience, I'm so stuck in opinions, my opinions, others' opinions, social opinions. And then sometimes I can just sit with something and feel it joyful. Feel it, feel it like really physically, like, whoa. Uh, and I think that's important. I like that. Thank you. I take that, that with me. Comes as a last <laughs> comment. Um, Thank you very much. It's been a, a wonderful conversation to have with, with all three of you. I've learned a lot. And I think that's, the, that's why we're here, yes? To learn and to talk and to get ideas from each other and to grow and who knows what's going to happen next. So thank you, Annie. Grand Rising to Claire and to Ada and to Yubi. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed today. It's really lifted me. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ade.
Thank you so much, everyone, and, and Claire, those last, or, or those continuing <laughs> words, <laughs> the, uh, that, that, was, that was key for me as a good reminder, you know, what makes you happy, what excites you, um, can only, you know, I, I, I think that's the way to go. So thank you, everyone. Pleasure thank to be you. here with all of you. I'm rising. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to today's guest, Claire. Thank you very much for, for joining us today, Claire. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Okay, lovely so to be here. So thank you. This has been a Ran Usha's conversation on art. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.